Thank you, Roberto. Thank you to all the organizers uh, for having me here. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's really a delight to tell you about our recent work, especially to this audience. And uh, we have already heard quite uh, a, a great introduction from Giorgio. And um, I'll just say that you know the ideas of jamming and glassy behavior has been heavily uh, used and analogized in biological systems. Um, and we have already seen examples of where density is the main driving factor uh, of a fluid to a solid transition, where essentially as cells divide to increase the density, uh, the dynamics will slow down correspondingly, just similar to what we study in particulate jamming, for example. And I should note that, you know, maybe just to clarify some earlier question, the words of jamming on jamming glassy behavior has been used almost interchangeably in the biological uh, or tissue mechanics community, even though we do have more specific um, sort of roots for, for those um, words, perhaps in physics, but they have been used nonetheless almost um, in, in different contexts. Um, so, for example, you know, the phase diagram that we have uh, used, we have already saw different versions of this. Uh, this is one from OJ Compass Group in uh, looking at in the living embryo, uh, whether it is poised near the jamming surface or the glass transition surface, and whether the embryo actually can take advantage of being in and outside of that surface in order to carry out development. And you can see that picture is basically the same kind of a phase diagram that uh, actually Veronique, who is uh, in the room, uh, worked on many years ago for attractive colloidal particles. Um, so except that you replace some of the axes by perhaps active forces uh, rather than uh, thermal temperature. So that's one obvious, uh, very sort of uh, direct root of jamming on jamming fluid solid transition in biology. And also we have saw, uh, we, we saw just one example uh, from also Giorgio systems uh, in where density is not necessarily changing in many systems, yet you can still undergo a transition from a solid to a liquid-like state. You, um, perhaps it's due to other factors like motility, uh, like flock-like behavior. And in, on, in terms of theory, um, over the years, um, starting in my postdoc, uh, I've worked on various versions of vertex space models to try to explain the system and also to think about perhaps, you know, these dense tissues uh, in terms of connections to soft matter as almost like kind of a dual uh, system which shares a little bit of uh, what we see in particulate systems, but also has features from, say, a fiber network um, that can undergo rigidity transition. So the goal of my talk today is to look at really the shear response near these type of uh, transitions and uh, also rheology and the nature of fluidity. Um, so I'll just uh, say a few things about the, the, the things that I won't actually talk about, but would be really happy to, to chat with you privately. Um, so we have worked quite a bit on really understanding what is the nature of the rigidity in these tissues without the change in density. Um, how do you carry out, say, for example, a modified version of the Maxwell constraint counting? Uh, we have also looked a little bit with the experimental groups on trying to distinguish various roots of, of jamming on jamming uh, and how does that compare to the epithelial mesenchymal transition. Um, uh, also, we have dabbled a little bit in cancer in thinking about what do mechanical heterogeneous uh, mixtures of tissues uh, behave as and whether that can actually drive invasion. Um, in going to the third dimension, as we were uh, discussing yesterday, we began by putting cells on curved surfaces and looking at the effect of topology and surface curvature. Um, and actually, Shri is in the room. We also applied quite a bit of glassy physics to understand unusual roots of um, sort of where cells can invade with these unusual glassy behavior by simply tuning a local uh, time scale that controls the T1 transition. Uh, in also going to 3D, we are really focusing on three-dimensional tissues and the mechanics of multi-layered, when you stack up these layers to form, say, the skin, the epidermis. Um, and then maybe something uh, familiar to the uh, people in the room, uh, you know, I wanna advocate that these 
models for cellular structures or these examples of cellular structures really make a great template for thinking about designer materials. And one of the uh, uh, aspects that we looked at very recently is to think about hyper-uniformity. It actually comes out surprisingly easily from the cellular uh, models uh, and a tunable, a high degree of tunability in terms of um, all kinds of hyper-uniformity you can get. Okay, so onto the topics uh, for today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the nonlinear elasticity of these tissues. Actually, we're gonna have a, a talk tomorrow, I think by Guillaume Charas, uh, who uh, really inspired us in trying to use these models to study shear response. This is what they carried out almost uh, more than a decade ago in just taking a monolayer and applying a mechanical stretch to it and asking what is the stress versus strain curve. And they study things like uh, fracture, uh, nonlinear elasticity in these kind of models. And another more extreme example of shear response and perhaps you have seen this from the group of Manu Prakash, where they looked at this animal that's only made of epithelium, uh, is able to essentially deform itself due to internally generated motile forces. And those forces are so large that it can actually break the organism into different parts, used for like almost a mode of asexual reproduction. And then I'll talk a little bit about rheology. Um, and then finally, if there's time, talk about how hexatic order really can matter in terms of going between these fluid to solid transitions. Okay, so um, we already had a very lively discussion yesterday about the vertex model. And I'll just say that, yes, we use a very simple version of the vertex model, uh, almost geometrical in origin. And it's really based on the assumptions um, that you know, it's inspired by what people have done for many years with foams, but then you put in a few biologically um, driven interactions. One of the most important one is the middle term here, which is the interfacial energy or the line tension that sits at the junctions between cells. And this is generated, you can think of a contractile tension due to the contractility of the cell cortex, but also the cell-cell adhesion will try to elongate the edge, thereby giving you almost a negative line tension, right? So that's the motivation of such a term. And just one note about cell-cell adhesion, if, it, um, if you are wondering, this only capture one aspect of cell-cell adhesion uh, because it really doesn't, it sort of gives you a slow energetic contribution of cell-cell adhesion, but it doesn't give you, say for example, the viscous friction-like uh, um, nature of cell cell adhesion. So um, that's maybe something that's, um, that's quite needed in a model, but I'll just say that for today, we don't have that in this version of the model. And then in the last term, there's the um, effect of the cortical ring, which is a structure that spans the entire periphery of the cell. So that's like a, just having a elastic band all around the cell. Okay, and we, we saw from Soroj yesterday that you, know, you can write this in a very geometrical uh, version and uh, where you essentially get a preferred area and preferred perimeter. So the, all of the interesting behavior of the model is really due to the fact that you often cannot satisfy both of these constraints at the same time, um, right? You can't often have the same, uh, some area and whatever perimeter you like. Okay. Connecting these kind of model to experiments, that's really one very important step to take, not just to you know, carry out the, the computational work. Uh, one thing is that these models predict mechanical forces that can typically be measured, for example, using laser ablation in this movie where you just actually take laser and cut one of these junctions, and by looking at how fast the re retraction velocity is uh, and infer uh, tension based on that. And there are more supracellular stresses that can be also measured using, for example, monolayer stress microscopy. Uh, there's a very nice body of work from um, a, a couple of Japanese groups, Ishihara and Sugimura, where they really uh, delve very deep into trying to think what is, you know, given some set of experimental data on, uh, say, a particular kind of tissue, what is the appropriate model to, to use and whether one model is better than another. So they apply the ideas of Bayesian inference to say, you know, can we actually judge 
And if that works, uh, how can we infer the parameters with a high accuracy? And I should say that, you know, these models don't always work universally for all tissues. Of course, cells will have different kind of interactions. So there are different versions of the, the vertex model that have been written down um, specifically for um, different kinds of tissues. Okay, so today, I, you know, I wanna focus on first the elasticity. So what we did with the model is just to simply shear it. And this community, I think, is very familiar with this kind of um, a protocol, so it's essentially a thermal quasi-static shear, AQS, right? So we take this model, uh, do quasi-static, so at every step of the simulation, um, the stress is uh, being plotted for the states that are locally uh, energy minimized, right? So every state is force balanced, and you can actually see a movie, although this is just going through all the strain steps. And you can see that perhaps the things that you are uh, used to seeing with other non-living materials uh, where you have these uh, stress sort of stick slip uh, events. And also I'm labeling all of the cells that participate in T1 transition. And sometimes it's like almost a system spanning event. Right? So for today's talk, and, and I should say Lee Edwards, and there's actually experiments that do this kind of simple shear setup for large amount of strain. So uh, for today's talk, I'll really just focus on the startup regime here. Uh, and we have a very recent preprint on thinking about the, uh, the steady state uh, behavior, but I won't go too much into that today. Um, and I should say this work was in collaboration with Christina Marchetti and also Suzanne, uh, who is here. Um, okay. so. What's the uh, shear response what's in terms of, say, shear modulus? So with this model, uh, we actually, you know, one of the first things we did several years ago is really without shearing it, looking at what is, whether it's a solid or liquid. For example, you can calculate something like linear response shear modulus without actually doing the shear. And the prediction was that less than, you know, below some critical value of the shape index, which is, PG, uh, which is the P0, uh, it behaves as a solid, and above that, you lose the linear response shear modulus, and we call that a fluid. So what actually happens if you shear a state like this? Not surprisingly, it's going to give you this kind of uh, solid-like behavior. You have some nonlinear buildup of stress, and then you undergo these uh, series of stick-slip events. So nonlinear elasticity, some intermittency due to the plastic rearrangements, um, what was interesting is really on the fluid side, right? A fluid, by definition, should not have a shear modulus to begin with, and that is consistent only in the beginning. So if you start to shear it, actually there's some finite value of strain where the stress starts to build up. So what you have done is actually taken it uh, initially from a liquid uh, state into a solid-like state at a sufficient large amount of strain. And this is quite comparable to, uh, uh, for example, strain stiffening that people see in, say, uh, fiber networks. Yes, I know. Why, how a fluid cannot have a modulus? You can have viscoelastic fluids. This is at the zero frequency. Right, okay, okay. yep, yep. But then, but then this isn't zero frequency, right? This is, this no, is no, all no, five percent. But this is a startup of flow, is it not? Oh no, it's oh, called, it, well, that's 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 right. Right. Yep, yep, I'm with you now. So why is this not like shear jamming? Yes, so it's like strain stiffening. I was going to mention the other similarity is perhaps the shear jamming. Yes. So if you start with a, with a on-jammed state and with the application of shear, you can jam. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, so as a function of different values of P0, what we see is that, you know, if you start already in the solid state, you get this kind of a typical stress strain curve. But if you're in deeper and deeper in the liquid, you need increasingly higher values of strain. And to summarize that, you can have you know, a phase diagram uh, of this critical strain as a function of P0, where um, over here, right, you obviously don't need any strain to stiffen, but uh, here you need a finite amount of strain. So uh, what I won't go into today are you know, all the different kinds of ways we use to characterize the nature of that transition, 
uh, to see whether it is critical, what are the scaling exponents. Um, but I just want to take a, a couple of minutes to say, you know, what is a simple intuition for why you expect a rigidity transition at all in these kind of geometric models, these vertex models. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, here it's only about the shape. There is no activity. Uh, there is no activity. There is no activity. That's right. So only later on I'll add activity. But so far it's just taking that shape-based Hamiltonian and looking at the, the states while you shear. Okay, so for, um, for, for this, I'm gonna use a really very simple, a, a single polygon description uh, to convince you that there would be a rigidity change. Um, so consider just a single polygon, and we can start with like a square, but you could have a hexagon or any number of sides. And uh, for a regular polygon like the square, it would have, if it has area one, then you would have perimeter of four. So what are the different ways, think about, are there any ways I can distort this shape without changing both the perimeter and area? So um, usually I would take, uh, take a survey, but I'll just say that um, there are no ways to do it if you start with a regular polygon. Because, so I'm excluding, by the way, any uh, trivial rotations of the shape, right? I'm talking about, say, affine deformation. So there are no ways to do it, uh, but if you start with something that's distorted from a regular polygon, for example, a slightly stretched a rectangle, which would have necessarily a perimeter greater than four, uh, for this, there's really a family of shapes uh, that will have the same P and A. And the reason I'm doing this exercise is because in, these, um, in the energy function that we use, is all it relies on is the perimeter and area. If you find ways to keep the perimeter and areas the same, you are essentially in the same energy, right? If you are starting in the ground state and manage to find other shapes with the same PNA, that means you are just always in the ground state so that you would have a degeneracy. And if you cannot find ways to do that, then you have to necessarily change PNA, therefore energy would go up and that's rigid, okay? So just to formalize this a little bit, um, you can think about say simple, uh, affine deformations of a single uh, four-sided polygon. And these are some of the ways in terms of the deformation tensor components where you can distort it without changing P and A. So all along this contour, same P and A. And um, so a regular polygon basically is at the center of this deformation space. The solution space is a single dot. But if you go away from a regular polygon, you have a larger and larger solution space. And I can just formalize this in terms of the energy for a single cell shape. Um, and you can see that if you plot it or if you look at the energy, it looks like a, uh, it has a m to the uh, uh, quadratic and m to the fourth term, where m is, the, um, is essentially the radius along this contour, right? So in the liquid state, you have this almost a, a ground state degeneracy to go around where it's, um, always in the liquid if you just keep going around there, while in the solid, anything you do will incur an energy increase, therefore giving you a stress. Okay, so that's a very mean field description, Bubu. I understand this from the energetic perspective, but you know, my old days of uh, doing hard condensed matter, if I look at spin liquids, which are, we call them rigid, because they have power law correlations, uh, they all satisfy the constraints. So there's a huge ground state degeneracy, but we still call them rigid, but they're critical, right? They're, they're power law correlations. So is there a point here where if I look at correlations, their power law, so I would sort of call, they're sort of at a boundary of being rigid. They're rigid because they have long range correlations. Yeah. Uh, is there a similar thing here? We haven't done that. This is just for single cell shape, but it would be good to look at the correlation. Okay, so in the second part, um, how much time do I have? Eleven minutes. Eleven minutes. Okay, so uh, in the second part, yeah, three. So moving on to something else. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess even. For a single cell or for assembly, it's, you, you should like and could or could be looking at zero modes, right? The floppy modes is that yeah. sort of 
Uh, so the assemblies will all have zero modes and right so you can shear it on, until you exhaust all of the zero modes but that's where you get the rigid but we do look at it but I, I just uh, skipped off that and talked about a, a single cell description I also take the advantage uh, before you do something else um, you really think that there are conditions under which it's possible to see avalanches in the uh, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so perhaps this is one system we are looking at, where in the germ band extension, where th there are quite a few T1 transitions, we're trying to see, is it possible to say, you know, one T1 actually gets influenced uh, from a previous T1. But there are, I should confess, there's not too many great examples yet. Not obvious examples that I know of. People, if anyone knows better examples. Okay, so uh, so moving on from the quasi-static, I want to talk about the active rheology. And just a quick motivation: if you think of developing tissues, uh, especially in the germ band of the Drosophila, for example, um, cells are undergoing a lot of plastic rearrangement. And I actually have a movie for that. Um, you must have seen this where. Really, it looks like T1 transitions inside a foam. Um, these T1s are not just driven by the external shear, which is they do receive from the sort of surrounding tissues pulling on the germ band, but also locally, cells are able to contract on their own, exert active contractile forces um, on the uh, edges in some very anisotropic way. So how do these internal versus external uh, sources of driving uh, drive the, the rheology of the tissue and the rearrangements. And this is what we looked at with uh, Michael uh, Hertag and also Suzanne Fielding. Uh, Michael was a postdoc uh, working with Suzanne, where we together looked at the sort of active version of the vertex model and looking at the rheological response. So here's the equation, the overdamped equation of motion, where we apply simple shear at a particular rate. and we, uh, again, use the interactions that are derived from the vertex model, uh, same functional form, and then finally add a very simple form of cell motility. Um, so uh, this doesn't have flocking. Uh, cells are really not talking with each other. Um, this is like the simplest thing if you want to make the cells active, where the cells are just self-propelled at a constant uh, active force V0 along some direction which is randomly rotating at a certain rate. Right, so when that rate of rotation is really quick, you can almost think of the system as um, uh, Brownian. In, in, um, right, it loses any memory if, if that rate is really fast. Okay, so, but it still gives us a way to look at how do these internal sources of driving interact with the external rate of driving. Um, I'll just sort of recap by saying that uh, if you don't have any driving, if you're not shearing the model at all, we sort of worked out uh, a version of this model um, using the Voronoi version, and here's what the phase diagram would look like. So as a function of the driving and P0, um, there's a glossy solid phase and there's a liquid phase. Um, so these are sort of, you can throw the typical ways to characterize what's a solid and fluid in terms of diffusion, and you would see that there's a phase boundary which comes down at the point of 3.8, uh, which is that sort of zero motility limit of the vertex model. Zero motility rigidity transition. Okay, so what happens if I start to shear on this side while increasing V0? And he, these are the flow curves, the stress versus strain rates, right? So not so surprising from perhaps um, uh, eight, uh, 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 sheared, uh, say, granular suspensions. Uh, for example, here you would have a yield stress deep in the solid phase. Um, and as you increase V0 to fluidize it, you will actually have Newtonian viscosity and then some sort of nonlinear uh, behavior. Um, so it's a yield stress uh, fluid on this side as you change V0, right? So it becomes interesting on the right-hand side or on the right-hand corner here where I showed you there's a strain stiffening where you have like a shear jamming behavior Essentially, you have to apply enough strain to jam it. 
enough strain to rigidify it. So what happens if you shear at a particular rate on this right-hand side? So what happens is that starting here at a low V0, you would have a yield stress typically. And then as you increase V0, and if you shear at a particular rate, you see the curve will jump from a Newtonian branch onto almost this you know, upper yield stress-like branch. That's, uh, everyone has um, seen this behavior. It's called discontinuous shear thickening, where the uh, stress shoots up on, almost uh, vertically, where you get a huge viscosity at that particular value of the shear rate. Okay, so where that shear rate is will depend on the value of the internal driving. So it's really a competition between the two, right? Yeah. Controlled or stress controlled? These, These are strain rate, rate controls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Martin. Can you show which of the uh, flow curves uh, correspond to the, the boundary point? Oh, um, so I, I, I didn't label them, but, but it's basically once you get past the boundary, you will, um, you will not have a yield stress over here. I think, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have the value. I can show you offline. Yes. Upon the definition of yield stress, or what, what's the nature of this transition? Is it really a, like a first order phase transition to develop a yield stress? So the yield stress, I think, vanishes continuously um, uh, at as you uh, um, if you if you go like this, right? So so the yield stress will uh, will vanish at some particular v zero star. Uh, as you increase it. Okay. So um, we did look structurally at what happens uh, because there's quite a bit of literature on DST, and we also wondered what are the how are the forces transmitted in such a system, and we see that you know this is a typical stress versus strain plot in the uh, near the DST behavior. And um, you see that you know sometimes, maybe half the time, it's behaving almost like a liquid. So the stress is nearly zero and not doing much. Right, the stress there is really just proportional to the shear rate that you apply. And then uh, occasionally, uh, the other half the time, you actually build up these uh, structures of stress, almost like force chains. But here, these are tension chains that span the whole system. And here's the statistics in terms of the stress and uh, this is what happens at the onset of, of DST, okay? And here, um, as a function of V0 and gamma dot, I told you where DST happens depend on what value of this, um, these two parameters are. And the color map here is the viscosity. So here you can see in terms of the viscosity, as you cross this line, it really jumps discontinue. Uh, it, it jumps up quite large um, when you cross this line. But you can actually avoid the whole DST, essentially not having um, a, a abrupt transition by going around uh, this line, which ends at this point. So we have a very simple argument for why there is a DST. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's where DST essentially uh, will end. OK. So what is the, yeah? So you show that you could uh, derive a, a probability to be in the high viscous branch or low viscous branch. And what, uh, what controls that probability? Can you tune it or is your system? Um, it would be where, so in this case, if you are, um, uh, it would be changing either the, the V0 or gamma dot. You can tune the relative probabilities of which state you are in, whether you are sort of taking the lower branch or the upper branch. We haven't done a lot to check that, but I think there is in some of the tests that Michael has done. Okay, so a very quick, also simple explanation for why there's a DST. Um, so I think it in part has to do with the fact that there is an underlying strain stiffening or shear jamming transition. Uh, and essentially, you know, if you can achieve, accumulate this amount of strain in the system, then you're likely to exhaust your parametric, 
your isoparametric iso area constraints, and then essentially you get into a rigid state, right? So how do you accumulate this amount of strain? And that depends on ultimately the shear rate, but also there's a dissipation mechanism that tries to go against it, right? So you're trying to accumulate shear. At the same time, there are these active forces which are uh, acting to dissipate the shear that you can accumulate. And the, the accumulation time scale is given by the alpha relaxation time uh, of these cells. So basically, the typical time it takes to do a T1 rearrangement uh, sets the time at which that will dissipate uh, the, the stress you can accumulate. So if you can put on shear faster than you can uh, dissipate it, then you would be able to achieve the critical strains needed to undergo rigidity transition. Okay. Yeah, so my, okay, great. In the last five minutes, uh, I wanna talk about something that's also quite new. It's our work uh, together with my student, Yuan, and also with Mark Bowick at KITP. Uh, in looking at uh, topological order uh, or organization of um, sort of geometric order near these fluid solid transitions. So I'll give just you know, one example of a fluidized tissue where the cells are really elongated, right? So you might argue in this case, it is very appropriate to apply things like pneumatic order to think about these systems. So they're really rod-like objects that tend to align in their shape as well as their motion. But on the other hand, you have these very well-developed static quiescent tissues that are almost fully ordered. They're, they're really hexagonal, they're honeycomb you know, like. So the question is near the transition, what is the appropriate order metric to apply um, to look at this, right? So here obviously pneumatic would not be the um, dominating geometric order where you should perhaps look at hexatic order or hexagonal uh, kind of organization. So, and also the question is, is there a state which sort of has a little bit of both, right? Has some notion of rigidity in it, uh, but also has flexibility um, in terms of rearrangement and so on. Um, so one obvious thing, again, from condensed matter physics is how do you go, you know, ask about if you're melting a crystal uh, to go from a, a fully ordered state into a liquid, you are necessarily forced in 2D to often undergo a transition in between. So there's an uh, a intermediate hexatic phase, which is kind of a mixture of both of these. Um, it doesn't have translational order as a crystal, but it actually retains orientational order, and that's um, what we would actually uh, wanna, wanna look at in these tissues. So, yeah. So, this analysis, we need to have a sense of what the lo preferred the local orientation order is. And, and for the system that you're looking at, do you know what that is? And is there a, an answer if I ask you? So, there's often probably not, not, a, not a globally preferred orientational order unless we are local. Uh, so, it will be the, the six-fold order. That's what I want to understand. Where that's coming from. So, right, so you can, you can think about all kinds of six-fold, four-fold, two-fold order. And um, in fact, so, so Luca Giomi has done some work in thinking about which one is the dominating order um, in what tissue you look at. So, he actually does the work of sort of considering all of them. But here I would argue that, you know, after you do all of that, here is this, the six-fold order is the dominant one. Yeah. Okay, so here are the order parameters for, for testing transitional orientational order that we're all familiar with. Um, and then in terms of topological defects, um, one signature of the hexatic phase is the presence of these isolated dislocation which are pairs of five and seven-sided polygons. Uh, where, whereas here, there's basically no defects, but on the liquid side, you would have a mixture of both five, seven dislocation, but also sometimes they can break up into isolated fives and sevens. Okay, so the kind of model we use is again similar, except here, 
um, we are adding a very important factor, which is uh, cell division. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's, so there's some previous work by uh, uh, Pika Chamara Massimo uh, to look at using the same model to look at whether there's sort of this melting, this sort of two-step transition in such a model. And they, they did see that there's a, a, you know, you can go from a crystal, not directly to a liquid, but you have to go through this excitic in between. Um, but I want to argue that a lot of these biological tissues, uh, while they have a high degree of motility, they're also dividing. So this is a proliferating uh, MDCK monolayer, um, just, just a movie taken from the Yamada lab, where really, again, you have these two sources of driving, right? You can think of active force due to division as a way of the drive, the liquidity, the, the fluidity, and also the active forces inherent to the cell crawling. So can you still retain some degree of order even when cells are, are dividing? Okay. And there are some um, evidence for six-fold order uh, in the early syncytium of the fly embryo. This is before actually cells cellularize. Um, and they actually see that even, so when you have rounds of cell division, the six-fold uh, hexatic order goes down, but actually recovers quite quickly, um, even at, you know, a few minutes after division. Okay, so um, quickly the model had, we put in division as well as cell death. So, um, um, the simple parameter that we control is the rate of cell division. And I'll just show you uh, the results directly. So here is a, without cell division, okay? Um, this is not so different from the two-step melting phenomenon, where um, if you increase V0, you would go from a, a crystalline state to a hexatic state and to a liquid state as you keep increasing it, okay? So here you can see the psi P basically decreases before you exit out of the crystalline phase, but the hexatic order parameter is still high in the middle, and then both of these order parameters are low um, in the liquid phase, all right? So you have this band of hexatic phase um, without cell division. What was surprising is that when you turn on cell division, uh, while all the other conditions are the same, as you increase V0, what you see is that as soon as you turn on cell division, there is no crystalline order anywhere, okay? And, but in the middle, you still have surviving hexatic order. So you turn kind of a traditional melting scenario into a reentrant transition from a liquid hexatic to a liquid state. So, yeah. Your simulation, how do you get like the exactic, like the exactic and crystalline that's a value? I mean, because experimentally it's a pretty, finicky things to know if you have the crystal in the exact phase, yeah. finite size. How right, so in the simulations, we do all of the uh, conventional, we check for the susceptibility. Uh, we do correlation functions to see how it decays, um, to extract the exponents, to judge <laughs> where these boundaries are. But you're right, it's tricky. You can't rely on just the order parameter itself to say where the, the phase is. So these boundaries are marked with the peak of the hex hexatic um, uh, susceptibility. Right, so it's rather surprising, and it really shows as soon as you have any division, no matter how slow the cells are crawling, you cannot have a crystal. You would ultimately just, um, if you allow divisions and wait a while, um, you will never have a remaining crystal. And here is the full phase diagram uh, where you can see you know, the dark red band as a function of cell division rate and motility force, that's where we get the hexatic phase. And the dotted line here, this narrower band, is where you have the conventional melting, right? So you actually greatly expand where the hexatic phase is by putting in cell division. And I'll just very quickly um, show you, um, so uh, these are what the defects look like, right? In the hexatic phase, you have these isolated dislocations only, but with division, even at low motility, um, you, you just cannot have a crystal. So um, I know I'm running out of time, but very simple cartoon of how to think of what cell division and cell, cell death do 
to generate these defects. So they both sort of generate these pairs of dislocations, two fives and two sevens that are tightly bound together right after these events. And the question is, what happens if you put on motility, you put on the temperature in these generated defects? Um, so when motility is low, you generate cell division, will generate these kind of four uh, clusters. Uh, but then when you have a low motility, they're really not enough to rearrange anything in the system. So things are just stuck. So you just keep on multiplying a lot of these four clusters. And in the end, you just get a bunch of um, dislocations, but also disclinations. Uh, essentially, you just keep accumulating disorder into the system. And in the middle um, is where you have that hexatic phase, is you just have an intricate balance of generating these fourfold clusters, uh, but you also can resolve them with the proper amount of motility. And when you're at a high motility, you just keep both motility and cell division generate both of these types of defects. Okay, so we have a mean field model and that can predict really everything well, but I'll just um, not go on any longer uh, and just summarize uh, the, the few things that I told you about and um, thank the people in my group who worked on this. Uh, Jun Xiang worked on the shear simulation together with Suzanne, Christina, and An worked on the plasticity that I didn't talk about, and Ewan uh, worked on the uh, hexatic um, uh, motility, hexatic uh, phases uh, with Mark. Okay, wanna thank all the uh, funding agencies and thank you in the audience.